Welcome to the second part of the Angel Investing Digital Day. This is our third episode of the focus days of the FTS Digital Initiative. This morning we were talking with Simone Brunozzi uh, about his experience with angel investing in the Silicon Valley. And now we are uh, continuing the, the conversation with other three guests. So let me introduce them for you starting with uh, Kendall Burritt, founder of Digital Africa Investment. Thank you for joining us, Kendall. Thank you. Then we have Serena Torielli, co-founder and CEO of Virtual B. Always great to have you here, Serena. And finally, last but not least, <laughs> Matthias Kroner, fintech entrepreneur, founder of Fedor Bank, and of course, uh, co-host of Breaking Banks. Hello, Matthias. Ciao Francesco, pleasure being here. Likewise, so before starting the, the discussion, I actually want to ask each of you to give us a bit of background of your current activities, maybe putting a bit the tone more on your experience with angel investing, especially because I know that, allow me to say, for some of you, it's more a side job, but from others, and I'm looking actually at Kendall, is a daily job, right? Want to start from, from you, Kendall? Sure, great. So um, it, it is a little bit of a side job. Um, okay. Just to give you a little background on me, I've been working in Africa for the last 20 plus years um, across the continent. I invest on behalf of institutions, so I often help them deploy money and find great investments and do due diligence um, with them. I advise companies, particularly in the fintech sector, and I also do my own angel investing. Um, that started a few years ago. I became a little bit frustrated with the very, very protracted deal cycles of a lot of investors, and I saw these great companies that just couldn't get funding. So I invest primarily in, well, all, in, all of my investments are in Africa, and I invest in health tech, med tech, um, data-driven businesses, so a unified um, data API, digital identity, smart logistics, and I've recently gotten quite involved in um, businesses that generate local content, so music, games, um, films for, for Africa and for the rest of the world. Nice, thanks. Serena? There's a, there's a pause due to the unmuting process. Okay. <laughs> Uh, for what I'm concerned, my uh, activity, my role as an angel investor is a, a absolutely a, a part-time job because my job, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm fully involved uh, in my company. Virtual B is a data analytics company, uh, which uh, uh, basically uses uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, apply it to the industry of well management, so using data to uh, produce better solutions for, for, for clients uh, and a better service. So I, I, I'm not sure if uh, the money invested in my own company can be considered angel investing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 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 I anticipate one of the pieces of advice that I would like to share at the end. My experience as an angel investor is in uh, uh, areas is in fintech, so in areas uh, or in businesses that I'm close uh, to what I do and uh, that I can understand uh, with a little time of, uh, of uh, that I have uh, to, to really study the business. But in the future, I would like probably to expand uh, a little bit more, but uh, for doing that, I need to get some free time. <laughs> free time, <laughs> of course. Matthias. Yeah, it's, it's um, on my end, it's, it's pretty much like with Serena. Actually, I'm focusing on my entrepreneurial uh, activities so to say um for the ones who do not know me i'm focused on fintech as well so um i, I founded two banks in the course of my career so far uh i should say maybe hopefully who knows uh actually it depends also very much on regulation by the way if they are uh, so successful as, as the previous ones we hope so actually. yeah 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 well <laughs> look at what you cannot see or what you see is all the gray hair this is where it's coming from you know <laughs> so uh but by the way this is maybe what we then talk later about the downside of being an investor um, however, of course, I am happy to be invited in, in, the, in the ones or the other um, business angel activity. And, and by 
saying it as I say it, I, I also see that to be a great honor by, by the founders to be onboarded then. Um, I, I invested in, in two companies over the last 12 months. Uh, month. This is the one is Crypto Finance AG in, based in Zurich, Switzerland, dealing very much with, uh, as the name is indicating, crypto business as a B2B provider uh, for wealth management uh, banks, actually. And the other one is a company called Receive. And Receive is an AI-based um, collection support slash support company actually calling itself the end of collection based on AI coming to the end of collection, which I would personally appreciate a lot because uh, the value for that is uh, also very much for the consumer then. So yeah, so these are my, let me say activities and yeah, so far. Thanks, so Matthias. Yeah. Thanks. Actually, I want to start by continuing with you with the with my first question because, I mean, you've probably heard it quite quite a lot of times, but uh, this won't back off uh, back me off from uh, say you are one of basically the activator of the fintech movement, and as you were saying, you had the the privilege to be on both sides. So as Serena, be an entrepreneur as well, and also an angel investor. So what I want to ask you is uh, um, help us frame a bit more the topic, uh, try to understand a bit more how the role of angel investor has changed in Europe over the past 10 years uh, from your experience. Yeah, and so it's, it's first of all, uh, it's my experience and, and few only by that. Uh, and and uh, first of all, and second, of course, the last 10 years would now include COVID-19 phase four yeah, year now. Um, and and we, we, well, maybe let us exclude that for a while as long as it goes, actually. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, being a business angel actually is is definitely one of the toughest stands you you can take actually because um and there is something first of all that did not change it's it's about evaluating the qualities of the team that set up the business right uh, i think this is unchanged um it is However, uh, something that is totally forgotten sometimes when we speak about corporate culture and all those topics coming with corporate culture, it is sometimes totally undervalued. Um, people are very, very tech centric and, and believe that tech is, is solving kind of everything, which I would disagree strongly on, uh, being more from the business and market side also, but even having a lot of experience with only or only having experience with tech based banking. Um, and, and that is not the case. So I would say uh, even, and COVID-19 even is strengthening that development that the core of uh, all the discussions you should have as an angel investor or also at the company or being the founder that is uh, onboarding it, thus, so those investors, you, you really need to focus on what is the culture of your company? What is the future culture of your company? Because maybe you do not have a lot of culture, what you think, um, like, being three or five people in the beginning. Uh, but, you know, w even being alone, you already have corporate culture, right? So, um, so this is something that is more than ever important. I would say the quality of the team is more than ever important also because we are living in absolutely volatile or let us say VUCA days, you know, we are, it's, it's uncertainty is my second first name in those days. Volatility is my first name maybe. So, um, so nobody of us can actually predict. Yes, we have maybe best guesses and very well educated guesses what the future might look like. However, we need to focus how a team can handle thus unforeseeable volatile developments and 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 make it to a value centric strategy this is even stronger than ever before in uh, even now uh, driven by corona and probably uh, as serena was saying actually before uh, in order to lower a bit that uh, um, uncertainty it's really important when you know the business you are investing in so yeah. that could actually be a bit the, the balance no I, I, I see what I see, that, that's a very good point, Francesca. What I see clearly as a development now in my little fintech world 
is that we come to maybe a third wave of uh, corporate creations um, by fintech founders of the first wave you know and 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 that i find to be a very interesting development why is that happening because i would say you know fintech started something like 10 years ago it depends on how you calculate it or whatever you want to see as a starting point so let us say it started 10 years ago now we have the kind of first iteration or even second generation of companies already being maybe um you know the, the whole thing didn't work out so they stopped it or they got acquired or they consolidated actively or they got sold whatever way so there's a kind of first generation second generation already happening now those people like like taking myself as an example you leave the company you sold the last shares now you sit there we, we are not old enough actually to be in pension you know at least personally i would not feel like that so you sit there all day long being bored the garden is fine you did the garden five times already this day so what to do you know it's a bit overdoing it but um actually i didn't do the garden so <laughs> <laughs> but but and you have a lot of good ideas because actually the teams around you have a lot of great ideas and the technological development coming back to that yes is offering you day by day new opportunities okay and at a certain point you say okay this is it here we go we do it again yeah? and then you come to the point saying okay but what type what type of mistakes i did last time what type of mal developments i had to suffer last time how can i improve that you know so i use for instance i used the time leaving feeder i used the time and had a series of exit interviews it was my exit and i had a series of interviews with former team members of feeder and asking them listen what was a make or break situation for you why did you leave the company why had you been upset when leaving and so on and so forth and we need to understand that people are joining visions when we found it but they are leaving managers when we mature the company so this these these all these kind of mechanisms and learnings we repackage we try to be better we come to the point what i call value or let me say high quality startups and this is definitely another development we will see yeah thanks and from the uh, from what you were saying uh, i i was actually thinking about the role of uh, of angel investor like uh, you were saying uh, and I was an entrepreneur, I made some mistakes uh, and I, I can actually be able now to advise better the companies or to uh, see what they are doing and to, to judge better the teams and so on. And I want to ask Kendall actually about this because of course uh, um, one positive side of having an angel investor involved in your company is all the things also Matthias was mentioning. Uh, experience, uh, the network, uh, and, and so on. But on the other side, sometimes it happens that uh, uh, an angel is so passionate about what, what, is, uh, what he's investing in that it's quite difficult to, um, uh, to cut the boundaries between being an angel or think it's your own business, it's still your own business, you know? Do you have any experience with that? What's, what's your idea around it? Thanks, Francesca. Um, I'll be honest, um, I haven't really had much of a problem with sort of that overstepping. In part, I know what I know, uh, I know what I don't know. <laughs> um, and having invested on behalf of institutions, I'm very aware of what good governance looks like. So as an investor, I certainly don't want to be telling the, um, the founder what to do. I want to be able to help them. I want to be able to facilitate for them. Um, and, and that's where I can, I can do the most, um, most of my value add. And, what I found in, in, in Africa, just on that point, um, is that, I mean, Africa first is a wonderful place to invest. Um, it's a great place to invest now because there is so much unmet, de unmet demand. Um, and because of that unmet demand, it's really forcing innovation in sort of basic services like information, healthcare, financial services, education. Um, so it's forcing innovation and tech enablement is really allowing founders to, to leapfrog. And because there isn't the legacy there, um, they're able to, to really build from scratch and take the lessons um, that they're learning from their own experiences. But as Matthias mentioned earlier, what's interesting even with FinTech is that I think a lot of the new businesses around, um, for example, healthcare um, are, are, are really the result of a convergence of sectors. Um, so it's not so, you know, fintech, 
you can make a payment. Um, you may be able to do other kinds of financial services, but at the end of the day, you're trying to solve a problem for a customer. And what you see with a lot of these tech enabled um, business models is really a convergence of sectors um, that make it easier to discover customers, to serve them, um, and, and it requires sort of the joining up of ecosystems. So that's something that's very interesting in, in, um, in Africa right now. As an angel, the value addition I can bring is really, you know, I've been working across the, con the continent for, um, you know, 20, 20 plus years. And so a lot of founders are very country centric. Um, but because markets are so fragmented here, um, it's difficult to scale unless you have a multi-country model, a regional or pan-African model, and, you know, eventually global. I mean, that's, you know, there are a lot of entities that are, um, that are, that are looking for a global markets um, to serve with sort of their innovative um, value proposition. So, so one of the things I can do, and it's kind of different from a lot of angel investors, is I invest in a lot of different countries in Africa. And what I can do and what, how I can help sometimes my investee companies is to really use those networks to expose them to contacts in other countries that sort of help them give, uh, help give them sort of a more regional view of um, opportunities for their business and then exposing them to networks sort of globally in, in other countries and markets. I don't want to go into a lot more now because I know that there are three of us in the panel, so I'm going to stop, <laughs> stop talking. But um, yeah, that, that's, um, it's a great, there's, there's a great opportunity here and I just look for the value addition that I can provide without telling them what to do. Great, thanks Kendall. And actually while you were talking, I, uh, I was thinking that uh, for the first time or for a few times, we are actually three women and, and one man, which doesn't happen so frequently <laughs> in, our, in, our, in our jobs. But I don't, I, I don't want to get into the, the conversation. I'm a woman being a woman in the fintech world. But I want to, uh, since I personally know Serena quite well, I want to ask you about your personal experience, but more, um, I want to know from you what you consider your very personal uh, strategic advantage, let's say, when talking about investment. I know you are doing a lot uh, um, in terms also of the financial education, letting people know what, what this whole investment scheme is about. So I really want to maybe to understand from you some suggestion that you, you might give to even a woman or a young person in general that want to approach this, this field. Listen, in business and you know that I never thought about myself uh, as a woman or a man. Uh, it's just something, and I told to, to, to you and Matteo many times, yes. I realized yeah. that I'm strange uh, in the eyes of the people <laughs> that I'm talking to or, or uh, uh, because, uh, and from the number of, uh, of uh, interview and uh, events where I'm invited uh, as a woman. So for me, uh, what I would say that, um, in general, let's talk in, uh, uh, about angel investing, but also in my activity as an entrepreneur, women tend to have uh, a, a better empathy. And uh, when you uh, invest uh, in, uh, when you do angel investing, at the end of the day, you invest in people, you invest in teams, you invest uh, in entrepreneurs. Obviously, you need to have some uh, execution capability, but uh, I would say if I had to, to pick the most important single factor, I would say it's the people, no? And uh, as an entrepreneur and uh, as a woman, uh, you need to feel uh, a lot of empathy. So uh, with this person in order to invest, maybe I can judge, I can meet the, the best uh, uh, business model, but if I don't feel something personal, yeah, yeah. It's something that I, I know in advance it, it shouldn't work. And many times, like a, a friend of mine, a psychologist told me, uh, what uh, uh, we call gut feeling is nothing else than uh, you know machine learning in your head uh, about something that has been working in in, in the past. No, so I would say that uh, as a woman, uh, um, use empathy and uh, uh, use your emotion in addition to your uh, you know the model, the numbers, uh, the business as a, as a tool for evaluating your choices. So that's uh, uh, for sure. A, 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 a piece of advice I would give and another one for a, I don't know a younger me would be don't be afraid I was reading here yesterday a frightening statistics that uh, I don't know 35 percent of the uh, women entering the tech world they, they leave it uh, 
by before getting to 35. So we, we just, we don't have uh, as a, a problem in, uh, you know, attraction, but also in retention, and, and which I found very sad. So don't be afraid. It's full for opportunity. And I think the, um, the talent uh, and the a different approach, uh, uh, like the one most women have, is, uh, is uh, very good. And uh, I think that this crisis and the pandemic show it even stronger. So I think... Uh, uh, the, the female leadership. Don't 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 be scared of being different. Uh, I, I think the stereotype of uh, you know the macho man uh, driving a Lambo uh, because uh, after selling his startup uh, is not working anymore. And uh, um, with this pandemic, we got rid of of uh, many. I would say of, of, of uh, much stuff that was uh, not useful. So much of a fuzzy, fuzzy stuff as well. So uh, go straight, be curious, be yourself, be empathic, and just uh, invest and do things that you love. Otherwise, it's just business. Thanks, Serena. You got a Lambo after uh, Feeder Bank, uh, <laughs> Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> or <Ecco>. not? <laughs> no, I have a Fiat 500. <laughs> You're an humble guy. <laughs> la, la macchina più bellissima. <laughs> Bravo. Certo, certamente, certamente. No, no, so no. Let's, let's keep talking maybe about the, the pandemic, actually, Serena was mentioning. And I think that, except for women, women men, um, it's quite uh, uh, difficult many times for startups to, uh, to have access to capital. And this pandemic actually show us uh, uh, this even more. Uh, what I saw uh, in, the, in, uh, in the past months is actually um, a phenomenon that was uh, quite established even before. So we saw funds, VC, um, try to put money on a mature company, not really focusing on early stage startups or even more uh, inject liquidity in uh, in their previous investments, which is um, understandable, I mean. So, Matthias, I want to ask you, first of all, do you see uh, this tendency or am I say something completely crazy? And if so, um, do you think this is a positive side for the angel investors? Because in this way, they might get access to better deals. Or you think it's just a, a general threat for the whole ecosystem? No, I don't. I, I I don't think it's a general threat. It's it's. Um, I would say it's according to that situation in which we are in. It's I would say out of my perspective a totally natural re reaction. Uh, why? Because we know that. Uh, and and I had this discussion, for instance, with uh, uh, people in Singapore discussing that uh, also there. Uh, because we we need to actually, or all companies do react in the same way. Everybody is protecting its liquidity. So, so first of all, why is that needed? Because we do not know what's happening. So, insecurity is always answered with a ramp up of equity. This is not only in banking that way. Uh, it's it's I would say more more or less with all companies that way. Equity or liquidity. Uh, in particular can have two sources so it is paid in capital on the one side or it is beefing up your revenues so you also can see that a lot of companies are rising raising their prices actually uh, most recently we had a laugh and a joke because we received a letter by a as a service company saying yeah we survived actually corona so far so good and we are doing very well and this is why we increased the prices oh wow okay um in that moment of solidarity nice that we do this however we would not understand what corona did affect you in particular but anyhow this is what we see we also see this is also what we see on the on the company receive side because now companies do very much take more care of the receivables when it comes to the quality of paying customers or non-paying customers you know so th those are all i would say natural reactions um, of course, all that environment makes it very difficult for startups today 
to go out there and say, listen, I have a new idea and, and, and this is what we're going to do, or I have a better service or better solution and so on and so forth. However, I would say Corona is also delivering additional problem statements. You can now create in particular a company on, you know, because we can see that actually a lot of incumbents are overwhelmed by that suddenly digital development. You know, uh, there's a very nice picture on the web. If you Google it in pictures, it's saying who's driving your digitization strategy in the company. A, is it your CEO? B, is it your CIO? C, is it COVID-19? And everybody's taking COVID-19. And, and I fully understand that. So there, there are great opportunities. Um, those great opportunities in combination with what I said before, kind of quality startups are um, in a kind of second or third iteration of fintech are a huge opportunity. Um, I would say high level business angel and, and professional business angels do understand that momentum. It's definitely shaking out those uh, and I do not mean it that negatively as it may sound and, and maybe just take it as a lost in translation then, but those wannabe hobby business angels. And I really would appreciate that because I say, listen, this is not a straight road forward without any problems. So you might better stay out now, right? I would say the last 10 years, it was pretty easy. We all sailed northbound, so to say, um, Yes, you could do mistakes, no doubt about it. However, uh, the whole environment and the circumstances have been very favorable. This is currently not the space. So this is, this is the time for professionals because opportunities will be still around. And that's also the same message to the founders. Um, you know, if you're not that sure that your business makes sense now, maybe you wait another six months to see once actually... Uh, there's a clean sky and, and you can see again where you're going to head to. Thanks, Matthias. And uh, Kendall, what's your view on that? Also considering the, uh, the different geographies where you are investing, you are, as I understood, mainly focused on uh, uh, Africa. So it would be interesting for me to understand a bit more uh, from someone that is actually outside the European bubble. We, we hear a lot from what is happening here. But it's also interesting to understand more about Africa, not only related with the COVID, but in general. I mean, I can imagine it's also um, different, maybe more difficult or not. There is a different access to capital. There is more risk. Tell us a bit more. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are very good questions. And, um, you know, this, this access to capital issue is very difficult. Angel investing is very new in Africa. Um, so there isn't a lot of capital out there to fund um, businesses that are at the pre-seed or seed level. Um, there's a developing VC um, sort of industry um, and there's private equity, um, but at the very early stages, there's not a lot. So the role of angels is actually very, very important. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I believe over time, there will be a lot more um, African angels deploying money um, but it's also an opportunity for European angels or for, you know, American angels to, to also deploy money into the continent because the opportunity, as I mentioned before, is so great. There's so much unmet demand um, that, and there's so much opportunity for uh, um, innovation and the technology that's available now is really pushing, um, is really pushing um, very, Sort of cutting edge models. So, so, so for example, one of one of the you know uh, sectors that I invest in is health tech. Um, one of the companies that I invested in in Kenya was really pushing this theme around decentralization of healthcare to decentralized points of care. They actually launched in March, um, so at the dawn of COVID, and you could see. And, and this goes back to I think a couple of the points that that both Matthias and Serena were making around the team and quality of team. And I was sort of waiting to see, and I, I paid in actually very soon thereafter, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, but it was very interesting seeing this company that had a specific model and how they were able to evolve it very rapidly given the opportunities um, that were made available to them by COVID, for example, that insurers wanted to make sure chronic disease was being um, taken care of. So they 
all of a sudden were able to integrate a payer into their model um, that enabled them um, to, to sort of grow their, their market size quite rapidly. They also realized people couldn't travel. So that played into the decentralized point of care, but it also meant they had to join up um, the ecosystem to include the labs um, and other sort of diagnostic providers. So, so what's the point? Um, I, I think it's to say that, that um, because of the urgent need, you're seeing startups and, um, and founders who just think in a very innovative way and are able to move rapidly with the, with the market. And that's one of the things that I look for. I think others have mentioned team, but it's do I think they're going to be agile enough and flexible enough um, to, be able to, um, to be able to pivot or just adjust when unexpected things happen, which they always do um, in Africa in, in any market. Um, I forgot the rest of the question. <laughs> We're talking so no. much. Um, no, I mean, I think it's uh, you gave quite an overview of um, of uh, of your point of view of uh, of investing. It's interesting to understand uh, um, more the difficulties and, and the and the uh, the other side of uh, of investing in a country like uh, like Africa. And as you were mentioning, it's it's funny for me to to hear that, for example, you said. In Africa, angel investing is not, is not so common because many times we think about, when we think about emerging markets, we always think about Africa, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, or other countries. Um, but to be honest, and, and I'm looking at Serena, I don't think in many countries, even in Europe, uh, angel investing is so uh, widespread or, or common, to be honest. Um, it's funny because I was discussing this a couple of weeks ago with Roberto Ferrari, uh, that it's a former Italian, Italian banker as well. Um, and we both agree on the fact that it's, it's very weird being Italians, having so few angel investors over here and in general in Southern Europe. Um, and we were discussing the fact, the reason why is that, because, uh, you know, um, there is such a um, tendency of risk aversion, not only uh, towards startup, but in general, uh, when, when we think about investment. And I want to ask Serena about this, because, uh, you know, in my opinion, for example, I'm 29. And I'm like, uh, okay, of course, being an angel investor, uh, you need to bring experience to the startup, which is something that probably I cannot do right now still. But you know, this is my time to be risky, to be honest. I don't want to wait till I'm 50 or 60 to make a risky investment because at that point of my life, I want to be chill, to be honest, a bit more chill, okay? So my question to you, Serena, is more like, uh, why there is this uh, uh, behavior uh, in many places in Europe, this uh, um, fear of investing, especially when talking about startup, is there something we should do differently to encourage people to do that? First of all, I would like to start saying that don't consider Francesca as the standard person because the first time I met her, she came to me and she was... <laughs> talking about pension tech but she was very aware of the risk of her retirement so she wanted to start investing for her pension so and i did eh? absolutely so francesca is not uh, i would say the average in in any sense so uh, let's point that uh, not start. sure it's but, positive or not <laughs> no no it's very positive but I, I wouldn't do my business plan on you personally <laughs> Okay, uh, as you said, Italy is a very conservative country. I know I've seen a worrying uh, tendency across Europe, but the, after the pandemic, uh, the tendency of keeping uh, money into deposit accounts uh, has been growing. And uh, uh, worryingly, uh, so not by, uh, only by uh, private uh, investors, but also by corporates. So I saw the jump in the balance sheet of the European Central Bank, that was impressive. That was impressive, and I think that uh, comes down to culture. Italy is a, is a country where people are very risk averse. There's not even the culture. I would say that the average uh, um, portion of the liquid portfolio in equity is something that, 
doesn't exceed in normal times uh, 14, 12, 15 percent, which is very low. It's very different from the US. And uh, in Italy, like uh, in many other European countries, we have uh, people are crazy for real estate and then mm. come to tell me that real estate uh, is a safe investment. It's illiquid, but it's not safe at all. Let's see now, Milan. <laughs> Let's see, but I don't know, people, that's a culture, so it is a type of mindset. I think that on the other side, uh, we don't have uh, venture capital, very little, so we might uh, say, want to say that we have it, but it's very, I would say, it's very small, it's very tiny, uh, and you probably know. At the same time, the other uh, side of the equation is that in Italy we have uh, great entrepreneurs, small or, or big, uh, working in Italy, working abroad, uh, is a country uh, of a lot of uh, creativity and very good entrepreneurs. So, on the other side, I think uh, the, the uh, right uh, way to, 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 to push the culture, to change it, would be to uh, focus on this uh, uh, entrepreneurial spirit and the natural, I would say, the natural angel investor is a former entrepreneur or an entrepreneur because he's more, you know, he knows what he's talking about. Is I think he's... Uh, uh, it's better to have, uh, you know, less investor than uh, like something that was happening before the pandemic. Uh, you uh, people going around and you see the storytelling about, you know, getting rich with startup. Every startup becomes a unicorn and you have people <laughs> that has never invested in equity before wanted to start uh, angel investing. That's very dangerous. This type of storytelling is very, very, very dangerous. So I would say the, the, to me, the right solution in Italy would be First of all, there are some small networks, but to leverage a little bit on the uh, sense of, uh, you know, national pride for uh, Italian entrepreneurs, for the great ideas. For example, in Italy, there are outstanding startups in biotech and medtech that are, uh, you know, doing very well. But quite often, they get money from abroad. And also to leverage on the fact that uh, there are outstanding realities in Italy that, uh, you know, um, get money from abroad while in Italy is, there's plenty of money, there's plenty of cash, there's plenty of possibility to get funding and uh, a little bit probably to, 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 to take it as a, an opportunity to uh, change and improve this country to make, uh, uh, to make a change, to fight a challenge, to become more modern and digital, to get the place uh, we should deserve in the developed world because Italy is very I would say is very much behind in fintech and in general in, in innovation compared to the level of what it should be for the university, the talent, the people, the blah, blah, blah. And so I think that will be potentially the right angle. So to use, to build a network of uh, former entrepreneurs and, you know, uh, try to, is a little bit something that the state has been trying already in the past with the peers, which is a particular type of, uh, you know, yeah. investment for a small company. Use it as a way to help the country and uh, invest in the good entrepreneurs in the country. That might be the right solution. Thanks, Serena. So thinking about this, uh, even the, uh, the network of entrepreneurs is quite important. Matthias, tell me. Yeah, I'm, I'm listening to you, Francesca, and to Serena. Actually, it brings back to my mind that when we founded Fedor, actually, uh, that was in the middle of the financial crisis. And, and that was back in 2008, 2009. In 2009, we received the banking license by the German regulator. And actually, so we remember that is and was a currency slash banking crisis and, and then an economical crisis. Uh, and we've received so many times the question, why did you set up feeder in such troubled waters? Why did you set up feeder in the middle of that storm actually? And, and we said, listen, there is hardly any better time to set up a new way of banking in exactly that moment when all kinds of banks, in particular investment banks, have been under scrutiny by the public when you did see those movements like Occupy, Wall Street, and we are 99%. That was the moment in which we gave birth actually to feeder, and there couldn't be any better moment to do so. You know, you do not need a new bank actually if everything is good and fine and everybody's yeah. happy with your bank. You don't need it. Simply, that is the hardest time if customer satisfaction is very high. That is the hardest time to come up with a 
new concept and a new approach actually so i think um crisis is is uh, as we all know has a double meaning and and we should focus on the chances on it right then we should expect another another great idea matthias from this crisis <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> after thinking, after twelve years. <laughs> of course, I'm I'm the idea machine, and in particular, the the slots making that machine work are crisis. So yeah, of course, yeah, absolutely. Good, Good <laughs> yeah, to absolutely. know. I want to be an angel investor then. <laughs> so guys, before wrapping up uh, wrapping up this session, I want to just ask you one last question to each of you, just a take home for for our listeners your top do's and don'ts uh, for angel investing like what we should and we shouldn't do if we want to uh, to invest in a company kendall you want to start yeah i am um, uh, just a few points one i'm going to diverge a little bit i think from some of the other panel uh, members i mean i i don't think you necessarily have to be an expert um, in a, the sector of a company that you invest in you just have to have a very clear value addition for them um, I do think that that when you do go into a company that's um, in a sector that you may not know as much about, that you really need to make sure that you learn, that you continue, you continue learning, you continue um, understanding the company and the business. I always invest in an analog in the listed market, or as close to an analog as I can find. Um, and I watch that market, and I watch and see the trends. I, I actually attend, I just attended CB Insights Future of Health because I've been getting more involved in health tech. Um, and what it actually did was gave me the opportunity to, um, to and this was very helpful for the, the health tech companies that I work for, was to really take this language that had been codified in other more developed markets and really help transmit that language to them because they weren't, they were doing exactly what, you know, a lot of these innovative companies were doing, but they didn't know how to express it. And it became very clear to me, and they're you know, going through a fundraising phase, which is very difficult um, right now. And um, I, it was sort of light bulb moments for them when I was able to say, well, this is, this is what you're doing. Think about expressing it in this way. And it was very helpful. So I don't think you have to be an expert, but you have to be committed to learning and to keep learning and, and, and adding value. Um, I, I would say just as a don't, um, is just really pay attention to the, um, to sort of the instruments and terms, because it goes back to, I think what Serena was saying is that, you know, you just can't become an investor overnight necessarily if you don't really understand the instruments that you use um, to do that investment. And I've seen this be a real problem um, for companies and has made it difficult for me to actually invest. And in one case, um, you know, the, the investors were just sort of throwing money. The safe notes, which is, I typically invest in safe notes, um, in a one year period, they ranged from one million valuation cap to 15 million and not in that order. So it was going up and down. It made it impossible for me to invest because there was no, uh, I, I felt it was gonna be difficult for them to attract new investment um, because A, the shareholders were probably gonna start fighting with each other at some point when they saw these big differences. Um, and it just makes it very difficult to sort of value, you know, value the, um, the business going forward. So I would just say be, you know, be, be very cognizant of um, that what you're doing when you invest is, understand the terms, um, understand um, the, the history of what became before you, because you also need to start imagining what's gonna come after you and making it, making it possible, like you know, having very strict anti-dilution could make it possible for them to raise another round. So just, just sort of do your homework, I think, to make sure that you're investing in a way that's supportive for the, for the, for the business over the long haul. Thanks, Kendall. Serena, your do's and don'ts. Okay, so. Do's, I'll give a couple, do it if it's fun for you. So if you like to do it, not because uh, other people do it. Second one, uh, use uh, uh, your network, meaning uh, uh, invest, uh, don't do it alone. So invest is a, is a do and don't. Do it with, uh, I would say, a reliable or experienced investor. Also on, uh, given that usually angel invest together with VC, uh, check, do your homework and invest with experienced and valuable VC. So maybe we have an advantage over you in uh, looking at the numbers. Um, on the don'ts, I would say mainly one, don't do it if your only uh, interest is money because uh, uh, you need to 
to, to put on it uh, uh, much more than money. Otherwise, there are much easier, convenient, uh, liquid ways uh, to make money uh, rather than investing in startups. So. Thanks, Serena. Finally, Matthias. Yeah, um, thank, thank you. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of points are taken away. So, of uh, course, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? So, allow me just to, to walk through my list, however, and if there is now some redundancy, maybe translate that in overall importance, because all of us mentioned the same then. Uh, that definitely might be the case. So, I think, first of all, I always appreciate once a business angel did understand the concept of the company he or she is investing in, right? That helps a lot. Why am I saying this? I experienced the opposite. So, <laughs> so better understand what you do, right? Feel, feel actually understand in particular the mechanism, if I may say so, the mechanism of what is creating value with that concept and what is creating a risk. Really make yourself a risk assessment saying, okay, I understand if that is happening, make yourself risk scenarios. I understand if that is happening, that could create that kind of risk. How do we deal and mitigate with that and so on and so forth. So sometimes it's quite good to be a banker so because we must do something like that. So third, if, if you once you understood what the risk mechanisms and in particular the mechanisms of value creation are, is, and, and Serena and Kinnell said it, is how could you contribute to this? You know, whenever I'm now in the onboarding situation for a venture I started is actually saying, okay, listen guys, I wanna, you know, there is money in abundance, right? I could get money, I would say money straight away, walking out the door, having a kind of proper appearance, you can have money straight away, but make a difference what is smart money and what is just money. Okay, so as to the entrepreneur, I need to say, look for smart money. Um, to the investor, I must say, be smart money. So what makes you smart? What is, what is, why should I as a business, uh, why should I as an entrepreneur onboard you business angel and not the other? So, you know, because investors do not want to, or let me say founders do not want to be over diluted at a certain stage, in particular, not in, in this kind of, uh, minus one round of a business angel. So dilution is very sensitive. So you should, you, you only can take one business angels. You cannot take endless business angels. So how can you contribute to the story? Fourth, I would say it is very important to see whether you get along with the founders team or not. Okay. And, and that includes actually my learning and, and by the way, Francesca, because you said, yeah, by 50 or 60, you want to be relaxed. Hey, Sono cinque, cent, uh, sono cinque, uh, cinquanta cinque, so to say. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Not, not cinque cento. Uh, so I'm turning 55 this year. So, yeah, well, you know, what do you tell me? You're never going to be relaxed. Forget about it. You know, so. Um, I had this feeling. <laughs> yeah. So can you get along with the founder's team? If you have the feeling that actually your advice or your contribution is not wanted, uh, or, or maybe even that this team starts defending instead of accepting, um, then don't do it. If you self think you are too polite, for instance, then don't do it because why shouldn't you be polite? You must be straightforward. Uh, I say that as a German, you know, uh, however, you must be straightforward, which means if you find out that there is out of your experience, there is a kind of male development, raise your hand and say, listen, guys, I actually, at least let's allow me to ask, why are you doing this? Because out of my experience, all those kind of role models collapsed. So why do you think you are better now? So really raise your hand and, and maybe it's helpful. Don't be afraid of being impolite or even a pain in the ass. Fifth, who are the other shareholders? We, we, Kindle, you mentioned that shareholders start to fight. Yes, I can tell you straight away. Shareholders do start fighting. And, and I think it's in particular necessary to see that all the other shareholders are on the same page or on the same side of the table, actually, when it comes to the one question, how do we create value? Yeah, this is why we are here. We want to create value. Of course, we want to do good and so on, but not, and by doing good, we create value. So how do we create value? If there are, let me say, different options on the table that are totally contradicting, well, you need to sort that out before your money is in, otherwise you can't get out anymore, you know? Um, 
actually, and you will not get out anymore until liquidation of the company or until maybe M&A transaction and so on and so forth. So be and make sure actually that, and that's maybe the last point or the, the almost last point, but because there's another one, make sure you can afford your investment and more or less write it off the moment you do invest. Okay, this I would say makes yourself a safe sleep. Um, and then finally, my golden rule, don't invest in friends and family. Um, because you're not only going to lose money, you're going to lose a friend uh, if it's not working. And, and be sure you want to do this, right? So don't do this. And if you do this, declare that clearly and straight away as a present. This is it. This is a donation, full stop. I do not expect any return if you want to do it. But if you want to make sure that your friend already or still in the future is your friend, don't do this. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Matthias. Thanks a lot, everybody. It was uh, really a pleasure to have you here. And you gave us uh, a lot of very interesting insight. And uh, even the do's and don'ts, I was writing them down for myself. So <laughs> that's a good one. And uh, thanks a lot. Thanks again. Thanks, Serena. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks, uh, Kindle, for joining us. And thank you very much. Uh, to everybody for joining another Digital Day by FTS Group. Stay tuned at ftsgroup.eu for more sessions in the coming weeks. Ciao.